Good morning, Acton Faith Bible Church. It's such a pleasure to be with you again this morning and to worship God together. As we join in worship, let's sing this song, All Creatures of Our God and King.
Good morning. Well, it's drive-in church today, but if you're watching this, you might not be here. So uh, that's great, and we want people to feel comfortable and to be where they want to be. I've got a couple of quick things I just want to remind you about. Um, things are starting to open up a little bit, so uh, we are going to be having drive-in church on Sunday mornings. We might figure out a way to move into our buildings in some way on uh, at a, uh, on Sunday mornings. We're working on that idea. So um, it'll be different too, but uh, we're talking about that. So just be flexible and kind of pay attention to all the announcements. A couple other things, women's Bible study starting up next Saturday, which is the 13th, Women of the Bible, and Delilah is the topic. But you may not bring your shears. Your sp she's not a heroine. She's the villain. So don't, don't get too motivated by her. Also, um, masks so uh, my supplier of Acton Faith Bible Church face masks uh, is back up and running got a new supply of um, those and we can order them and so if you're interested in fact the new ones they sent me are a little bit better even so if you uh, are up for that so you can just let me know you can sign up uh, when you're around or you can just call me or text me or something like that and we'll get you some okay I'll order them okay I think that's it we're in Philippians chapter 3. So go ahead and open your Bibles to there and beware of the dogs. All right, here we are again together. We're in Philippians chapter 3, the first uh, section there. Today's wonderful passage in Philippians is of great value to, to the believer. God ordained the life of Saul of Tarsus, whom we know as Paul the Apostle. He ordained his whole life and his life as a Christian to be a, a living example to us. He was called and chosen and saved for the purpose of being an example. I mean, that's one of the reasons, obviously, to save his soul was a big reason. But he was an example of God's saving grace, being a murderer and a persecutor of God's people, yet amazingly and wonderfully saved. He says about himself in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says, It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost... Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. So if you ever feel like you're unsavable, you just look at Paul. He was an unsavable man that God saved. So he's an example of the marvelous grace of God. He's also, as we, we will see today, I hope in our text, a really great example of what actually defines a Christian the very essence of Christianity as it appears and as it should be in a life. Paul is a marvelous example of that. He helps explain what it means to live as a Christian, and I think often we get confused about that, so we really want to have a biblical view of how we should be as well as who we are in Christ. So Philippians chapter 3 is theological, but it's immensely practical at the same time. And that's why I think so many Christians love Philippians. It's amazing how many people have told me this is their favorite book. They see here and in the heart of Paul their own heart towards Christ. The Bible is, is perfect in how it weaves together truth with real lives so we can feel it as we read we can feel it as a human experience we see how salvation touched and changed paul in a personal way quite unlike anybody else in the new testament i mean all the apostles were sinners but paul was kind of a monster i mean he was a really bad sinner and uh, so it has a wonderful flavor of god's grace that i don't think we would think about as much with regard to peter and john and james and those guys they were all saved by grace, but Paul made grace shine more brightly because of where God found him and how God called him. So his life was transformed in the most profound way possible. He was born again, and that meant leaving behind everything he was devoted to and replacing it with the Savior he came to know. 
Jesus was entirely new to him. He gave his life to him. And that changed his relationship to everything he knew before that. Someone came into his life. Someone is what Christianity is about from start to finish and everywhere in between. So I think I can safely say that Christianity should not be fire insurance to you. That's not what the essence of it is. It's not embracing a religion to get God on my side, like the pagan religions are, and, it, and as so many people superstitiously approach God as, oh, I need blessings in my life. I'll appeal to this God that's out there. That's not what it is. It's, it's not a rigid set of doctrines. I mean, Christianity definitely has doctrines because humans were created to reason and communicate truth in words and propositional statements and truth. And we are wired that way. God created us that way. And some statements are true and other statements are false. And we want to be with the truth. So doctrine is important, critically important. But that's not what Christianity is. It is true, but it's much more than statements of truth. So today we're going to actually see what it is in the life of Paul, and that should be what it is in our lives as well. That's what we should be aiming for. Paul doesn't start with that, though. He's going to talk first about dogs. And by dogs, he means false teachers. Those who enter churches and corrupt the gospel with contrary ideas of their own. So we're going to get to the dogs in just a bit, but first, even before that, Paul, who's writing so much in this letter about joy, has to start off with calling on us to rejoice. So he does that all through this letter. So verse 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Finally means there's a new topic coming up here. But whatever he's talking about, there's this one thing we should do, and whatever his subject, rejoice in the Lord. He doesn't say hey, you know, like rejoice, it's good for you, it's therapeutic. He doesn't say that. He just says re rejoice in the Lord. He doesn't say just rejoice, he says rejoice in the Lord. So this isn't positive thinking we're talking about. Rejoice in the Lord is foundational. The Lord is actually why you can and should rejoice. How can we rejoice in the Lord? Well, because he's sovereign and because he's good, he loves you, and nothing on earth or in heaven or under the earth can diminish that love. There's nothing that can break the power of God's love for you. That's a reason to rejoice. So rejoice is not a psychological trick to play on yourself to keep your spirits up. That's not what it is. It comes from a deep and personal walk with Jesus, knowing him, trusting him, and resting your soul in his sovereign goodness to you. So rejoicing in the Lord is how you transcend difficult circumstances. Our country is going through very difficult circumstances right now, and it's distressing in many ways. But you know, even in all of this, even if you are in the heart of that, you can rejoice in the Lord because he is sovereign over all of it, and he loves you. You can know in your heart that God is faithful and so very good. And Paul could rejoice anywhere. He could rejoice with his feet in stocks in a prison cell. He could rejoice anywhere. So he continues in verse 1. He says, To write the same things again is no trouble to me. It's a safeguard for you. So what he has to say, he's saying, I've told you guys before, you Philippians, uh, and I'm going to say it again. Why? To keep them safe. Because sometimes we need reminders of things, right? Now, commentators like to discuss whether this sentence belongs to what he said before it, which is rejoice in the Lord, or what comes after it, which is beware of the dogs. So I think it's after, but it could be both. I mean, because it relates to both. Rejoice in the Lord and beware of the dogs are both things that keep you safe. They are safeguards. The Philippians are general, generally believers in life, you know, we need to do both things. We need to rejoice in the Lord. That keeps us safe from despair. And we need to be reminded to beware of the dogs. We, we need both things. Because it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget where our joy is found. And dogs are joy stealers. So we need to beware of them as well. So look out. So the dogs come into the church 
and you relate to them and you listen to them and your whole Christian life starts to get built on the wrong foundation if you accept what they have to say. The dogs will mess you up. Okay, so what's a dog? So obviously, we're not talking about Bow Wow dogs. These are false teachers of a very particular kind that he has in mind that plagued Paul through most of his ministry. And we're going to look at that in verse 2. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. So three times he says it, same Greek word each time, beware, beware, beware. Some translations put a different word or two in there to kind of make it a little more interesting sounding, but Paul's saying the same word each time, beware, beware, beware. It means look out, that's what it means. These three things to be aware of are all pointing at the same thing. It's a particular group that Paul has in his mind. So he's going to describe them in three ways. First, he calls them dogs, which in the Middle East, dogs are not pets. In the ancient world, Romans loved dogs, but Middle Eastern people, uh, Jewish people, Arabic peoples, they hated dogs. Muslim countries, mainly in the Middle East, they still despise dogs. Dogs are um, considered filthy animals. They were regarded as mongrel scavengers, um, filthy, unclean, and uh, that's still that way in that part of the world in many places. And it was obviously an insult to call someone a dog. And the Jews tended to call Gentiles dogs. So here's Paul calling Jews dogs, because that's who these people are. And then the second thing he does is he moves on to the broad description. He says evil workers. That means they're really bad, right? So it's the third thing that tells you who they are specifically. So dogs is a general derogatory term. Bad workers means they're actually laboring in the church to do evil. And the third thing identifies the group. The false circumcision, he calls them. At least in my translation, that's what it says. Very precisely in the Greek text, it's, they're, they're called the mutilators or the mutilation. That's what they are. My Bible says false circumcision. It's really just a delicate way of kind of uh, explaining Paul's intent here. The word false is not in the Greek text. In the Greek text, it's, it's more vivid and it's sort of meant to be, oh my, I mean, that's kind of what it is. So the, the word normally used for circumcision is, uh, it's, it's uh, peritome, peri, that word shows up in words that we have like perimeter, around, right? A perimeter is the measurement, meter is to measure, it's the measurement around the outside of a circle, right? So that's the word for um, circumcision in the Bible. Tome means to cut. Peri tome, so cut around. That perfectly describes the surgical procedure of circumcision. But here, in verse 2, Paul doesn't call them the false circumcision. That's not the word he uses. He doesn't use peri tome, and he doesn't use the word false. It's one word. It's kata tome, which means to cut up. And so he just calls them Beware of the dogs, beware of the e evil workers, beware of the mutilators, those that cut up. That's what he says. Now, the contrast we know is about circumcision because he's going to talk about that in the next verse, but that's actually what it is. So it's a very strong um, thing. These are the guys that cut up. They don't cut around. They mutilate. So this is a bad circumcision gone crazy. That's what he's picturing here. I don't even like to think about that. I'm sure you don't either. But the, the point is, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers. They have horribly abused and botched circumcision. And he's not talking about the operation. He's talking about what it means religiously. That's the point. It's a false doctrine based on their understanding of the necessity of circumcision for salvation. And you can see the key to all of this in verse 3, where he makes the contrast. He says, for we, now in my Bible it says the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. That's the key text right there, verse 3. That's what we want to focus on for our information today. That's what it's all about there. Now translators like mine, the, the my Bible, they insert the word true. That's to contrast with the word they inserted in the previous verse, false. But all Paul says is, Peritome. So he says, the dogs are evil workers who are mutilators. We are the circumcision. 
So he doesn't even have to say we're the real circumcision or the true circumcision, although that is the meaning, that's the idea there. But he just uses the word circumcision, we're the circumcision. And he's talking about people that aren't circumcised. He was circumcised as a Jew, but he's talking about Gentiles. So he's, he's, he's pushing there this idea, this doctrinal idea. So that's where it's all coming from. So the dogs are mutilators. The Christian, whatever his um, background, is the circumcision. So he doesn't have to say true. We're the only legitimate circumcision. So how is that? Well, here's how he describes it. We worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So obviously, Paul is saying they are failing in how they worship and what they prize, what they glory in, what they boast about. They're boasting about physical circumcision. He says, we're the circumcision. And he describes it in purely spiritual terms. So now there's a really important history behind all of this. So let me kind of walk you through that. It has to do with salvation, which is why it's such an important topic. And you could go all the way back to Acts chapter 15. You can look there if you want to. Give you a second. Time's up. Are you back in Acts chapter 15? There was a controversy in the very early church regarding the place of Jewish law and ritual. I know, I mean ones commanded by God in the Old Testament whether they belong in the church or not, whether Christians are obligated to keep them. Now, at first, almost every Christian was Jewish because the church started in Jerusalem, right? So people naturally just kept their customs and did the things they were raised with and that were commanded by Moses and all of those kind of things. But as the gospel went to most pagan lands throughout the Roman Empire, Gentiles are the ones that tended to respond in great numbers to the gospel. So Gentile dominant churches were springing up everywhere, everywhere Paul went to to preach. So there started to grow a conflict of practice. So the Jewish believers were kind of doing what Jews always did. They circumcised their children, you know, they followed a lot of the dietary laws and things like that. The Gentiles, they didn't do any of that stuff. They worshiped Christ. Their lives were transformed by Jesus. So the question was, are, are things commanded to the Jewish nation in Scripture, are they binding on Christians in the church, people who are under the new covenant? So is the new covenant life fundamentally different than the old covenant life for Israel? So very simply put, does a Gentile need to convert to Judaism to be saved, to belong to the covenant community, to be in Christ? The answer to this was not clear. So they convened a council. This is the first great council. Now, for the first four or five hundred years of Christianity, there were councils called to discuss important theological topics and hammer out an orthodox position on those things. This is the first council. This one's unique in Acts chapter 15 because the apostles are there. At least several of them are there that are mentioned. So um, you have the apostolic authority, but they're not throwing their authority around in this. They're, they're, they want a consensus. They're working for um, persuasion. So they make arguments. They're not just saying, hey, God says this. So it's pretty interesting how it, uh, it lays out there. So here's the problem. It's in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. This is what causes it. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So there, there was a ritual requirement for salvation to be saved by Jesus. These are Christians, people that are professing Christ as their Messiah, and they're saying you have to be circumcised to be saved because you have to be circumcised to be a child of Abraham. Now, the great missionaries to the Gentiles who preached the gospel of grace, they had to set this right. So verse 2, it says, When Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. And that's what they do. So they're going to the center of the church, which is Jerusalem, where the apostles are and where uh, James, the Lord's brother, is the shepherd there. And it's verse 4, it says, When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church 
and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that had God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed, these are Christian Pharisees, they stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. So not only is circumcision to be um, kept for everyone, Gentiles as well as Jews, but the law of Moses too. So dietary laws, things like that. They're starting to add on all the weight of the law on Gentile Christians. That's what they think has to happen. These are Pharisees. The, the Old Testament is their life, was their life before Christ, and they want it to be their life after Christ. Not only do they want it to be their life, they want it to be every Christian's life. So it's a huge topic. It has to be solved. has to be resolved. So Peter gets up and tells what happened at Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10. God called Peter, actually gave him a vision to go and, uh, and sent somebody to fetch him to a particular house of a Roman, uh, a Roman soldier who had a secular household, I mean a Gentile household, and God gave um, this Roman soldier Cornelius a vision to, to get Peter to come to him because he, uh, he was a God-fearer. He worshipped the God of Israel, but he was not circumcised and he was not obedient to the law of Moses. He believed he was the true God. So Peter went, he preached the gospel, and when he um, did that and when they believed, the Holy Spirit fell on them and people spoke in tongues. And Peter had not laid his hands on them. Now the apostles, we can pick up from the book of Acts, had this ability to transfer spiritual gifts to people by laying their hands on them. But this happened without laying on of hands. It was direct from God. So it's interesting. This is the first time Gentiles had been preached to and accepted Christ. And the same thing that happened on the day of Pentecost to the Jews happened to these Gentiles. So this is often called, this incident, the Gentile Pentecost. It didn't happen on the day of Pentecost, but it's the same thing happened. That became really important for Peter and his relationship to the Gentiles that he was preaching to. So um, because the Holy Spirit fell on them directly, he baptized them because he knew they were accepted by God's grace, right? Right? In fact, when it first happened, Peter told the Jerusalem church, he went back to the Jerusalem church, and in Acts chapter eleven fifteen, 15, it says, he says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he did upon us at the beginning. See, he's thinking about the day of Pentecost. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave them the same gift as he gave to us also, after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in their way? And he means stand in their way of getting baptized. They needed to be fully received and accepted into the church. So, later, this issue comes up at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, this great council, and Peter says in verse 8, And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving him the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe, verse 11 is like the key thing here, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. Wow, there's the foundation for the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith right there. And Peter is proclaiming it to the Jerusalem council where everybody important is gathered together. So salvation is by grace. Their hearts were cleansed by what? By faith. And faith alone. No ritual, no ceremony, no added rite he doesn't talk about baptism as a saving thing. It's when he realized that they were saved that he says, well, how could I have withheld this from them? He baptized them. So the council determined that circumcision was not required for a Christian. That's what happens in this story there. But apparently a fairly substantive group, maybe these Pharisees or somebody connected with them or that thought like them, broke away from the church and started their own movement, a Jesus movement with the law of Moses apart from the apostles, 
Today we would call that a cult. And that's exactly what it was. It was the first Christian cult. And they, if I can use this word, dogged Paul. Everywhere he went, they followed. Everywhere he preached the gospel, some representative from this group would come after he was gone and start teaching people that they needed to be circumcised. They needed to follow the law of Moses. That whole thing. They followed him everywhere. If he planted a church in Galatia, they arrived when he left and they taught the doctrine of salvation by ritual. In fact, if you read the book of Galatians, that's what it's all about. These, these dogs. Galatians is the, is the book where Paul says, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let him be accursed. He says that right away in the first chapter of Galatians. So these people are usually called by us, modern people, the Judaizers, because of their efforts to impose the Old Covenant on New Covenant believers, attacking the gospel of salvation by grace through faith. So we call them Judaizers because they're trying to impose Judaism on Gentiles. There's nothing wrong with them if they wanted to keep some of those rituals themselves, but they were imposing them on other people. And that Judaizing influence was an attack on the gospel. They didn't just say you should do it. They said you need to do it to be saved. So that was the great error. That was the, that was the heart of that cult. And that's what made them dogs in Paul's eyes. So the big question is, what makes Paul call those who follow the apostles circumcision? Why is he calling the Orthodox Christians that are following the apostles circumcision and calling the Judaizers mutilators? Why is he doing that? Because they're misusing circumcision. That's why they're, um, they're misusing it in a spiritual sense. The, it, their use of circumcision is actually against the salvation that Christ alone earned. And that's what makes it such a terrible thing. No ritual can add to the salvation that Christ earned for us. No ritual can complete the salvation that Christ earned for us. No ritual can finish the work that Christ accomplished for us. It was, he did it all. There's no ritual so even in the Old Testament, circumcision didn't have saving value. You weren't saved by circumcision. It was a mark that you were a descendant of Abraham and part of the covenant community, but you still needed to believe to be saved. Circumcision didn't save you. All it did was say you're a descendant of Abraham and you're fulfilling a, an obligation as a descendant of Abraham to be a member of the covenant community, but it wasn't saving even then. That's why so many Old Testament prophets would say to sinful Israel, circumcise your hearts, right? They were physically circumcised, but they had uncircumcised heart, hard hearts, hearts that were covered and were not open to God. So it started with Moses, just as the Israelites were all gathered and ready to enter into the promised land, that's where the book of Deuteronomy comes in, and the whole book of Deuteronomy is Moses giving the last call to Israel before he dies, three sermons, and a little extra stuff there in Deuteronomy to them before they enter the promised land. It's, it's right on the edge of receiving the promise, and he says to them in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them. And he chose their descendants after them, even you, above all peoples, as it is this day. So, circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no more. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality or take a bribe. Centuries after that, when Israel fell into sin repeatedly and repeatedly and God was about to call the Babylonians to come and destroy Jerusalem and take them away into captivity, he raised up the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah said to that generation, Jeremiah 4.4, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskin of your heart. Men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or else my wrath will go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. So you could be physically circumcised and be a completely corrupt, evil person. You have to have a circumcised heart. So the Judaizers were the greatest threat to the gospel during Paul's ministry. 
using circumcision to overthrow God's grace, putting a ritual in the place of faith. Paul even developed a little saying, and it's sprinkled in his letters, twice in Galatians and once in Corinthians. And basically he's saying, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. In other words, it doesn't matter. And he contrasts it, each time he does, he does it three times, each time he contrasts it with something that God does want from us. And they're all different. So 1 Corinthians 7.19, he says, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is keeping the commandments of God. And by that he means the moral law, the law of love, the law of the New Testament. Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. That's what God wants to see. Galatians 6, 15. Neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So, we are to be new, the new creation in Christ by the Holy Spirit. We are to have faith that works through love, and we are to keep the commandments of God. That's what a Christian is called to do. That's how we live. It's an astounding and oft-repeated declaration that circumcision, a rite performed on the physical body, is of no concern to God after Jesus came. That's what Paul is saying. It's nothing. Doesn't matter if you do it. Doesn't matter if you don't do it. We're talking about spiritual sense. If you wouldn't do it for health reasons, that's a whole other matter. But he's saying it doesn't mean anything for the Christian life. It has nothing to do with it. Here's a former Pharisee saying this. So all that points to this contrast that Paul gives in chapter 3, verse 3. The truly circumcised, what he just calls the circumcision. The new covenant believer What do we do? We worship in the Spirit of God, we glory in Christ, and we put no confidence in the flesh. So those three things, those are the marks of the circumcision, the spiritual circumcision, those who have a circumcised heart. Worship in the Spirit of God. So it's not about temples or tabernacles or rituals, but it's heart worship. You read this and you can't help but remember Jesus' words to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Remember that? He says, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain where she worshipped nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. An hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit And in truth, that's what it's all about. And that is Paul's first point in verse 3. The circumcision, those with circumcised hearts, are the ones who worship in the Spirit of God. Has to be God's Spirit, because without Him, our worship is nothing. He gave us the new birth by which our hearts are turned to God, to, to love God and worship God initially, and He sustains, the Holy Spirit sustains that faith in us that directs our hearts back to God. That daily turning of the heart to God. The Holy Spirit does that in us. Secondly, Paul says, they glory in Christ Jesus. He is our boast. He's our pride. He's our glory. What are you going to point to? Yourself? Hey, look at me. I'm I'm a saved guy. Well, why are you a saved guy? Because of everything Jesus did. He did it all. So I can only boast in him because I brought nothing to the table but sin. The Holy Spirit awakened my heart. Christ died on the cross and paid for all of my sins. He accomplished my salvation. I glory in him. I want to talk about him. I want to share what he did because I am nothing. He is all. The third thing, and this is the big point here, put no confidence in the flesh. So Paul can speak to this because That was his life before he came to Christ. He was prepared from birth to put his confidence in the flesh. All human beings do that from birth. That's that's our natural condition, to put our confidence in the flesh, whether it's religious or not religious. And his religious upbringing reinforced that all the time. And his adult religious studies confirmed that. Paul studied under the biggest theologian of the day and That was all confirmed. He never said, 
It's not important. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. It was everything. So they believed you could achieve a righteousness that pleased God by keeping the commandments, by following the rules. So as a Jew, he was all there. He had everything. And that's what the next part is about here. Verse 4. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anybody's going to have confidence in the flesh, Paul says, it's me. If anyone else had a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day like Moses commanded. And of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Properly circumcised, one of the chosen people from one of the great honorable tribes, a Hebrew of Hebrews, which probably means he had no mixed lineage. His mother's were Hebrew, his mother was Hebrew, his father was Hebrew, and their mothers and fathers were Hebrew all the way back. There were no Gentiles mixed in there. He's a true Hebrew of Hebrews. No Gentile blood slipped in at any point. A Pharisee, a Pharisee, he had the best theological education. No one was more zealous. No one was more self-disciplined. By their rules, and rules were their game, he was blameless, he says. He did everything a Pharisee was supposed to do. Some of those guys fudged on the side, you know. Paul didn't. He was that zealous and that dedicated. The ultimate religionist. And he let it all go. He let it all go. Why? Why would he do that? Because he had a deconversion? He saw through it all? It's not true. Is that what happened? He didn't get his questions answered in a timely way. Is that what happened? He set himself free from all this religious stuff? No. He believed it right to the bone. He was the real deal. Maybe he decided to pursue music and art instead. No, no. He never doubted his faith. But something did happen. He found something. Or I should say, someone found him. Someone much, much better than anyone or anything he had ever known. Verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He had honors. He had respect in his community. Things that most men would boast of. At least in their hearts they would. I do it right. I'm one of the top people in my culture. I'm... I'm, I do it better than anybody I know. I am more committed than anybody I know. God has to be pleased with me for all of that. He says, I let that go. I let all of it go. I didn't need any of it. It doesn't add anything to my life. That's a big change. Verse 8, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. Jesus is worth far more, far more than anything in this world. You can lose everything and if you have him, that's all you need. Paul had been so zealous that he persecuted Jesus worshipers. But Jesus loved him and saved him and gave him a new heart and forgave him all of his crimes and his fleshly proud religion. That's what it's all about. Most religion in the world is spawned out of some ideas in the human heart, right? Just speculation about how things are or should be or um, what the spiritual realm is like. And even people like Paul, who had the straight truth from God himself, the Bible, the Old Testament, they approached it as a means of self-glorying. It wasn't God-centered, it was still man-centered. I mean, he was a Pharisee, and that's what they were all about. Remember what Jesus called the Pharisees? Actors, right? So religion either seeks the gifts without the giver, 
or like Paul, used it to glory in their religious superiority. They boasted on the inside of their achievements, the the progress, the progress in the faith of their fathers. But that's just as fleshly as the most depraved pagan worship and practices. It's just as much of the flesh, that Pharisee life. Pharisees live to the glory of their own righteousness. But through Jesus, Paul found out that that was all dust and ashes. It was worthless, rubbish, garbage, refuse. Sin runs much too deep in human beings for us to declare ourselves righteous or think ourselves righteous. Much too deep. We're not righteous in ourselves. Paul was not righteous in himself. He was blameless in religion, but he was not blameless before God. He was not a righteous man. So he forsook everything, which was really nothing, to have the greatest thing, having Christ And knowing Christ and the foundation for that relationship has to be a clean record before God provided by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who literally bore the penalty of our sins. He paid our debt so we are truly forgiven before God. And God takes the righteous life that Christ lived, his righteousness, and credits that to us. He actually counts it as ours when he looks at us. Because Jesus paid for our sins. So it's a gift. The righteousness of Christ. He counts all his, Paul here, counts all of his religiosity as as rubbish so that he may gain Christ. Look at verse 9. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Faith connects us to Christ, and when that connection is made, all these spiritual benefits flow to us. First and foremost, foundationally, forgiveness, the gift of his righteousness. It's impossible to live a life pleasing to God unless it is rooted in a a profound understanding of our need for this outside righteousness. It's not ours, it's coming from outside of us. If you don't grasp that, then you're just doing religion. You're using Christianity as a religion. And you're not experiencing what Paul did. And you're not seeing everything else the way he did. It can all go as long as I have Christ. You have to understand that you need a righteousness that is outside of yourself, that is a gift of God, that only comes through Christ. And from that place of this wonderful forgiveness comes this, verse 10, that I may know him. That's a personal relationship. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. So what is this power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and all this? Well, the power of his resurrection, which began with the new birth, is that daily power to live it out. That's what he's talking about here. It's the power to walk in faith, the power to to rest our souls in God, to, to fight sin in ourselves and come out on top of it. And it's the power of a changed life. Matthew Henry uh, put it like this, Paul was as desirous to know the power of Christ's death and resurrection, killing sin in him and raising him up to newness of life as he was to receive the benefit of Christ's death and resurrection in his justification. In other words, Paul loved it that Christ died for his sins and he embraced that and received this righteousness and he equally cared about and loved and was excited about the power of the resurrection to actually have this work out in his life, this new life, this life of holiness and devotion to God. Powerful stuff. The power of his resurrection in our lives. Then he talks about the fellowship of his sufferings, and that obviously refers to all that we have to endure in this life for Christ, the rejection, the mocking, um, sometimes even persecution, I mean serious persecution. The, the godly know um, 
They know Christ in those sufferings. They experience Christ's presence in those sufferings. They bring us actually closer to him because we know that he endured so much for us and it takes everything else away but him. So even those normal life distractions are gone. Again, the emphasis is on our growth, our relationship with him. And then he says, being conformed to his death. And I think he's talking there about surrendering our life to him, the willingness to follow him to the end, no matter what, whatever may happen on this earth. Paul likes to use the language of of death to describe his own personal sanctification, his growth, his spiritual growth in relationship to Christ. Romans 6.6 6 is probably the most famous example. He says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. He uses that crucified language, that death language. And I think that's what he's doing here when he talks about being conformed to his death. In fact, in Romans 6.11, he says, Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So being conformed to his death is this recognition that we, sin really doesn't have to have power over us. It doesn't have to rule us. We can have victory over it. We can be conformed to his death through the power of his resurrection. So that that last phrase in um, Philippians chapter 3 is in verse 11, in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. So now he's looking forward to the actual resurrection of his body. So the end of this great work that Christ did for us, the, the crediting of his righteousness to us, this marvelous relationship we have with him, results in our resurrection. The promise of the resurrection to the believer is real. It's going to happen. We're going to awake in his presence. It's not coming from religiosity. It's coming through a savior that God provided for us. So when the dogs come and they have their own ideas and their own path to salvation and put confidence in the flesh, whether it's claims that we are worthy or it claims that we're good on the inside or that we're just so lovable God has to let us into heaven because you know he's just he's just so tender-hearted towards us or if they're the type that promote rituals uh, as a means to salvation whatever it is whatever form the dogs take leave it behind leave behind the barking of the dogs and embrace the someone who gave his life for you the someone who achieved your salvation completely, the someone that gives you his righteousness so that you can stand before God clean and accepted and not having to fear any condemnation from him. Leave behind the barking dogs. Never let anyone move you from under understanding that your salvation is a work of God, not yours. Dogs point you to things you have to do some kind of ritual, some kind of practice, some kind of thing. Sometimes it's as simple as joining their church or their movement because we're the only ones that do this. Look, everyone else does something different. We're the only ones. So that sort of thing. You have to prove your faithfulness to God by doing these things. That's the dogs. You know, my favorite book as a child when I was about five years old was Go Dog Go. And every year, my wife has me read that book to her kids um, in the Readers or Leaders Day. And all these people come in from around the community and read to the kids. And I always read, and I still do, I did it this year, Go, Dog, Go. It's my favorite book. Well, that's what we say to the dogs that bring a false gospel. Go, dog, go. (laughs) Go away. Go away. (laughs) That's our word for false teachers. Go away, dogs. Go away. Away from here. Nothing saves but faith in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Lord God, our great and good Father, keep us safe. Safe from the dogs who draw attention away from Jesus. And keep us safe from focusing more on life's trials and burdens than on you. Rejoice in Christ is what you ask us to do. Keep us mindful of that. May we never seek to be right with you by anything other than the sufficiency of him, our great Savior. Keep us in him joyously, joyously in him. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, next week we're going to pick it up 
right here in verse 12 of Philippians chapter 3. Hope you're with us.